Hey everybody, Chromos here with my second TCS video. And since we had some air-to-air -air weaponry last time, in this video we will take a look at a few air-to-ground options and their use in a mission. Also, in my last TCS video's comments it was suggested that I take a look at the SU-25T, as it is one of the two planes you get for free with the base TCS World module. And I thought this is a good idea, so this video will focus on this plane and some of the armament options for it some because there's quite a few and they don't fit all in one video, at least not if you want to show some action of them in use as well. As with the last video, this is meant to give a basic overview of the weapon's function and use and show them off in a mission and it is not meant to be a tutorial. Well then, let's take a look at the SU-25D and see how much bang you get for no buck. And spoiler, quite a bit I would say. The Sukhoi Su-25 was developed in the 70s as a close air support aircraft, sort of a modern successor to the IL-2. The plane is generally considered to be the counterpart to the USAF A-10 Thunderbolt. In comparison, the Su-25 is a bit smaller and lighter than the A-10 and as a result also a bit faster and more agile. However, it is also less sophisticated and can't carry quite the same weapon load, though what it can carry is still impressive. Now, one of the shortcomings of the original SU-25 was that it was lacking in anti-armor capability, and we will see why a bit later. This was one reason that led to the development of the upgraded SU-25T, which was built in small numbers in the early 90s, and among some other modernization increases the plane's anti-tank capability, that's what the T stands for. The T variant was developed from the two-seater trainer version of the SU-25, and the second cockpit was replaced with upgraded avionics which also made the plane a bit heavier, so it is not quite as agile as the original SU-25. Now let's go over real quick about some of the weapons we will use. Just a quick overview, the rest we will go over in the mission. Now internally the SU-25 has a twin barrel 30mm cannon. The weapon is smaller than the A-10 SCOW-8 Gatling cannon and has a lower muscle velocity, but still a high rate of fire and can be considered the second most powerful cannon in DCS after the GAU-8, though in my opinion it shares the second place with the long barrel 30mm cannons found on the KA-50. The cannon on the SU-25D had to be moved from the nose to the belly of the plane to make room for a targeting system. As a result you will feel the recoil impulse of the cannon more in the T than in normal SU-25. That's why the cannon is normally set to fire short 10 round bursts, though you can put it to full auto if you want to. For external weapons the SU-25 has 10 hardpoints. The outer two however are only for the R-60 air-to-air -air missiles or ECM pods, which leave you 8 for air-to-ground weapons, from laser guided missiles to 23mm gun pods. Now, the most common weapon system you will find on the SU-25 are unguided rockets, which come in many sizes and variations, starting with the tiny 55mm S5 rockets that come in 32 round pots, so you can carry 256 of them. However, because of their small size they are not that effective. All the way up to the huge S25 rocket with a 340mm warhead, which is fired from a single shot tube and everything in between. The most common one is the S8 80mm rocket in 20 round bots. They provide a good mix of firepower, ammo supply and the ability to saturate an area. You also get different warhead variants, for example heat or high explosive, or a heat and fragmentation mix. Their use is straightforward as it gets. Your planes avionics create a BIP, a predicted impact point on the HUD. You point it at what you want to shoot and do so when the system gives you the launch clearance. Being unguided though, their accuracy is very dependent on the circumstances. Wind, for example, will influence the ballistics of all unguided motions heavily. So when it is windy, you might have to do some test shots to see how you have to correct to hit the target. Rockets are versatile weapons, which you can use against all kinds of targets, but generally you need to be somewhat close to the target compared to other weapons and therefore often in range of return fire. Now let's talk about the second group of unguided weapons we have in this video unguided freefall bombs. As with rockets they come in all sizes and variations, from 500 kilo bombs to cluster munitions dispensers. With the two switches on the lower left panel you can set the amount of bombs dropped, one pylon, two pylons or all, as well as the time between drops on the left switch. Again the aircraft avionics will help you with the utilization of the bombs and get them to where you want them. On a somewhat modern aircraft there are usually two primary modes for this one being CCIP, continuously generated impact point, the same as with rockets, and for dive bombing, 
and then there's CCRP, continuously generated release point for level bombing. The SU-25T will switch between them on its own depending on the situation. For example, here we are supporting an attack on the city and are attacking a defensive line along a tree line. We have six 250kg bombs selected, set to drop them all in one attack with a 2.0 second interval in between. Now we get the pipa to where we want to hit, press the release button and hold it down. Now we get a new pipa which indicates the release point. We just keep flying towards it, keep it in the center and when we are at the bomb release point the bombs will automatically drop. This way you can often stay out of range of lighter anti-air threats. Again, the accuracy is dependent on wind and altitude, of course. Don't expect to hit much on a windy day from high altitude. Dive bombing gives you a better accuracy in those situations. In this CCIP mode, you just point the pipa on the target in the dive when the line appears and release the bomb. This is more accurate as you are closer to the target and the bomb goes faster, but it is also more dangerous as it often gets you within range of AA fire. And you also have to be careful not to overspeed the plane in the dive. Thankfully it does have dive brakes. Now the last weapon group I want to quickly go over before we take a look at the mission in the plane are laser guided missiles. Now the SU-25, both normal and the T, have a laser in the nose which can be used to guide laser guided weapons. The laser is pointing forward and only has a limited cone of visibility. It can't look down or to the side, so it can't be used for laser guided bombs, only missiles and you have to keep flying towards the target to keep it in the laser's cone. It is stabilized though, so you can lock it to a point on the ground and it will stay there independently from the aircraft movement as long as it is in the laser's cone. A laser guided missile generally has a passive laser seeker in the nose, which can recognize a laser point, which generally is pulsating at a certain frequency, so the missile can recognize its laser point. Now on the standard SU-25 we fly here, you have to find and identify targets with your own eyes. Point the laser on it and lock it to that position. Now you can fire the missile and it will hit where the laser is pointing. The thing on the SU-25 is that it has only this stabilized laser and nothing else. Good enough for large stationary targets. If the target is moving however, you have to move the laser manually with the target while flying the plane to hit it, which can be difficult. And this is why the SU-25's anti-armor capabilities are limited. The plane has to be close enough to the target to visually identify it and when it is moving, as tanks on occasion have a tendency to do, hitting them is not that easy. You have to start your attack from close range and get even closer till the missile hits, generally putting you in harm's way. And this is where the SU-25T comes in. Among some other upgrades, the biggest addition to the plane is the Schqual TV targeting sensor that has been added to the nose of the plane. With this targeting bot you can search for and identify targets from further away, thanks to the magnification of the bot's TV camera. It also has the ability to recognize and lock onto targets, everything from trucks to ships, and track them automatically. So once locked onto a moving target, the camera and laser, if turned on, will follow the target automatically. The system still however has only a limited visibility to the front. Since the TV camera only works in daylight, there is however an optional infrared bot, called Mercury, which you can fit and works the same way, but provides an IR image for night attacks. On top of that, the SU-25T also has access to some modern ATGMs, the Vicar and the Dank missile. You can carry 16 of those. They are so-called beam-riding missiles, meaning instead of a laser sensor in the nose that can see a laser point, the missile has a laser sensor on the tail and will try to simply spiral around the laser beam until it hits the target. That way the missile can be cheaper and this system is harder to jam, as the laser sensor is looking back towards the friendly plane firing it, not towards the enemy that might employ countermeasures. On the downside, this way the missile can't be used for top attacks like a Hellfire for example does it, going up first, as the missile needs to follow the laser beam directly. This can be a problem at low altitudes where the missile, as it spirals around the beam, might hit the ground or a tree. But that's more concern for KA-50 pilots than for our SU-25. Well done, with some basic info about the weapon employment on the SU-25D, let's take a look at the mission in it. Now, here's the scenario. In our little fictional World War III, enemy forces have, in an attempt to open a second front, started a surprise amphibious landing at Potti. The unprepared defenders were quickly overwhelmed and the city conquered, giving the landing force access to a harbor. 
However, the Black Sea Fleet engaged the invasion fleet and in the ensuing fight both fleets suffered heavy casualties and had to withdraw and regroup. Neither fleet is capable of continuing the fight without reinforcements. That leaves the invasion force without a safe supply route for now, and as a result, the heavy mechanized units start to advance along the coast to the south. Their obvious objective is Kovuleti Air Base. If captured, it would allow them to bring in supplies and reinforcements via heavy cargo plane, and this can't be allowed. Sadly, friendly units in the area are weak, as they are needed elsewhere. Units close to the airport have set up a blocking position here, and reinforcements are coming in from the airfield and some from the south. But even with those, the friendly ground units are outnumbered and outgunned, with only a handful of Morgan tanks available and otherwise APCs and infantry fighting vehicles. Most friendly air assets have been destroyed by surprise cruise missile strikes and commando raids right before the invasion. What little is left is ordered to support the defense of the airbase. Only two Mi-24 Heinz, taking off from Kovaletti, and our Su-25T coming from the south are in range and capable of providing help. Thankfully, Intel suggests that the invasion force did not have time to land heavy anti-air equipment, and the Ticonderoga-class cruisers that were meant to provide additional air defense to the invading troops while close to the shore had to retreat with the rest of the invasion fleet, so air defense is expected to be manned pads only, as well as vehicle-mounted machine guns and cannons. The mission is to engage the attacking force, blunt their attack to such an extent that they cannot break through to the airfield and if possible do enough damage to the enemy force that a counterattack by our defending units can push them back, conquer their forward command post here and establish a new line of defense a bit further away from the airfield to wait for additional reinforcements from the rear. So here we are approaching the shore in front of Kobiletti Air Base from the south, as we started from another airfield in that direction. As we close in on the battlefield, we activate our squad targeting sensor to search the shore for targets. Our friendly troops are to our right, set up in a little village, defending, and we have two Mi-24s approaching from the airbase, but I have little hope for their survival. My plane carries 16 Vicar anti-tank missiles, giving me a great bunch versus armor units, as well as four S8 rocket pods with 80mm rockets with a heat warhead, as well as two cluster bomb dispensers and two R-60 armor missiles for self-defense. As I close in, I also activate my infrared jammer. The Su-25T has an infrared jammer pointed to the rear, located in the vertical stabilizer above the brake chute. This jammer helps to confuse IR missiles coming from the rear of the plane. The jammer, however, only looks back, so it will only work if missiles are coming in from the rear of the plane. Taking a look at the situation with the Skrull, it seems the biggest threat to our defenses are M1 main battle tanks, spearheading the attack. Our infantry fighting vehicles and APCs have no chance against those, so I pick the group in front as first target to engage with my Vicar and the tank missiles. Now the Vicar isn't the biggest ATGM around, and it might have trouble with the frontal armor of an M1, but it will go through the side or rear. The missile is also pretty fast, one of the fastest ATGMs in existence, giving me the ability to fire more than one in this attack run before I am too close. Trying to take out as many tanks in this first pass as possible, I get too close to the enemy though, and in the last second I can see two SAMs coming from the left, so I break to the right as soon as I can see them, to point the IR trauma at them. My countermeasure dispensers are set to automatic and are throwing out chaff and IR flares constantly. The first two missiles barely miss, and I think they were a bit too close to properly track my chat from that angle. I can see two more coming after me, and one more narrowly missing, confused by the jammer I assume, and the second one hitting a flare. I can also see our own anti-air units and heavy machine guns engage enemy air units to my rear, helicopters I assume, but I can't worry about them now and by the looks of it our AA guns have it covered. Now I have no idea how many more SAM missiles those guys have, I have not seen what shot them, but I saw where they came from, and I assume man pads. They were certainly infrared missiles since my radar warning receiver stayed quiet. Now I could try to stay out of range using the long range of my wicker, but eventually I will run out of those and have to go in closer to use my rockets and guns, and I am not 100% sure about the range of those things in the first place, so what I want to do is to try to take those missiles out by using one of my cluster bomb dispenser from high altitude on a position I saw the SAMs coming from, hopefully getting rid of the threat and then being able to operate more freely. Now the dispensers are used like a normal bomb in CCRP mode. So I climb a bit to get further away from the missiles and to get to a better altitude for the containers. I don't think I'm entirely out of range, but I'm on the clock, I have to get back to helping the ground units, so I have to take the chance. 
I aim for where I thought I saw the missiles come from, press the trigger and keep it pressed, and pull the nose up and fly towards the new Pippa. As I reach the computed release points, one of my dispensers opens and releases close to 100 small bomblets, combined heat warheads to penetrate the roof armor of tanks and fragmentation versus soft targets. Then I go evasive and look down, expecting to see missiles coming up, but there aren't any. Maybe they were out of them already. I keep an eye on the target area and just as it is disappearing under my wing, I can see the explosions of the bomblets on the ground. I hope I took the threat out and go back to concentrating on taking out tanks with my anti-tank missiles to hopefully stop them from overrunning our defensive positions. I still have quite a few of them left, I only fired three, though I think one of them missed as I was evading the SAMs. I fly out over the sea a bit to do another attack run from the side, to get the weaker side armor of the tanks, and this time I plan to stay a bit further away as I'm not 100% sure if there are no more SAMs. Primary target is still the M1 tanks, of course, as our units have a better chance to deal with lighter units themselves. This time I fire only two of them in the attack run. Still, I get pretty close, too close for comfort, but I don't see any more SAMs coming up. Some 50 caliber fire from the tanks though. I could get more missiles off in one attack run than two if I slowed down, but I want to stay fast and stay maneuverable. I managed to take out two more tanks, but there's more. As I pull away I can see some explosions close to the forest, our ground troops taking out some lighter units that were advancing up there. The enemy units have by now almost reached our defensive lines though, and are about to overrun it. If they do and destroy all our defending units, there's nothing between them and the airfield, so I have to be a bit more aggressive. So I come around pretty quickly for my next attack run, losing some speed in the process, but I can build some back up as I dive towards the target, another group of M1s, which is almost on top of our units. I approach a new group of tanks and fire first one and then a second weaker missile, and then even though I am getting too close I decide to try to go for a third one to stop the last tank before it is able to reach our defensive line. I do get the third missile off, but the third tank is turning into the attack and I hit it head on and I don't know if the missile went through the frontal armor of the M1. The last M1 also drops smoke, but the beam riding wicker missile is pretty resilient versus this kind of countermeasure. I can't see more SAMs coming up, but I take a few hits from 50 caliber guns as I fly over the enemy units. Luckily the SU-25 is pretty well armored and I don't notice any severe damage at this point. This time I turn around in the other direction and attack from inland. I see some more enemy units on the Schwal, but they're just APCs. Not that big of a threat, but since I'm already pointing at them and I'm too close to look for other targets already, I fire a victor at one of them, I still have a few of those missiles after all. As I overfly our positions after the attack, it is not looking good. I can see lots of smoke and fires coming from knocked out vehicles and I don't know what we still have left. I need to stop the advancing units yesterday. So I fly out over the sea just a little bit and then turn around to look for the enemy targets that have advanced the most. I can see some armored personnel carriers coming up, but again they are not that big of a threat. Further behind though I can see some more units driving towards the airfield and they are already past our blocking position, which makes me wonder if we have anything left alive down there on our side. But for now I just have to assume we do and take out those units that got past the defenses. I can identify them on the Skrull as Striker MGS, a light vehicle with a 105mm gun on top, which gives it a good punch, weakly armored though. I fire at both of them as I approach, but this time my first missile misses its mark. I do manage to take out the second one though. Now I take some more hits from 50 caliber fire, and I assume those are coming from the armored personnel carriers I saw further back, so I decide to return the favor. The armored personnel carriers aren't really worth my last wicker missiles though, so I switch to my S8 rockets. I have four of those 20 round bots for a total of 80 80mm rockets, with a heat warhead sufficient to take anything out that isn't a somewhat modern main battle tank. As they advance in a line I can strafe them with my rockets. Now the striker left alive worries me though, as it seems it is on the flank of our vehicles and the 105mm can take anything we have out. So I want to get rid of this thing before it does that, so taking the striker out is the next priority and this time my ATGM does hit the MGS and it is down. As I pull up from this attack run though and I look back I for once can't see any enemy units advancing towards our defenses anymore. It seems the attack is stopped, though there is some more fire coming from the enemy position in the little village nearby. Now I don't know what we have left and if it is sufficient to mount a counter attack. 
but by the looks of it we have almost nothing, if anything, still active on the ground, so if a counterattack is to take place I need to get rid of some enemy units at the little village, which is the target for a counterattack. Now, since the targets I can spot there are stationary and somewhat clustered up, they are a good target for my second cluster bomb dispenser. So I climb a bit, not too high this time, as I'm pretty sure by now that there are no more SAMs, and target three enemy units I can see on the road in front of the village. Again, wait to reach the CCRP, and my second dispenser opens up. I can't quite see if it was effective, but some enemy units started to move, so at the very least they are noticing that something happened that wasn't meant for their benefit. Now, with the main attack broken, the rest is pretty much cleaning up. I have 4 ATGMs and a few rockets left, and I spent them on some units I can see in the village. A few more strikers, a Bradley and some Humvees, which seem to have some tow anti-tank launchers mounted, which means that they are, as a matter of fact, a threat to any tank. What does surprise me is, when I pull out of one of my attack runs, I see an enemy vehicle explode behind me, which confuses me at first, because I did not fire there. But the mystery is quickly solved, as the MI-24 Heinz are coming up on radio, announcing that they are starting to attack targets. Now, this surprised me immensely. I assumed they got shot down very early on in the fight, but as it turns out, they just ran out of ammo, went back to base to rearm and are back for some more. Now, after running out of missiles and rockets to shoot, I do a few gun runs with my 30mm cannon and take out another Humvee or two, but in those gun runs I also get hit one or two more times by 50 caliber fire, so with most of my ammo gun and a few holes in my plane I decide to call it quits for today and return to base. By now there should be very little left, and with the surprising return of the Mi-24s I can see what I can do about this counterattack. Now, most of our ground forces were indeed taken out, but what I still have is a group of PMP-3 infantry fighting vehicles, just advancing past the striker gun systems that made it fit the furthest, our two T-90 tanks that came as reinforcements from the airfield are also still active, as well as one or two wheeled armored personnel carriers, a scout car and a T-55. Not a lot, but enough, as there is almost nothing left on the enemy side as well. So I advanced with the ground troops and eventually enter the village and the T-90 takes out the last enemy vehicle, the last mounted gun system at close range with an anti-tank guided missile, because the tank fired so much that it is out of anything else. So the enemy attack was broken and the village was retaken, the mission was a success, and I hope I could show you a little bit of what the Su-25T can do. Seems to me it brings quite a bit to the table for being a free plane, and remember, I have not shown you all the options for the plane, there are still some aces it has up its sleeve that didn't make it into this video. Well, and this is it for my second DCS video. I hope it was entertaining, thanks for watching, and maybe I'll see you next time.